Well, would you believe it? It's English Wine Week yet again. So here at Forever Thirsty, we don't miss a trick. We've got together with our old friend, Oz Clark, author, broadcaster, and author of the wonderful English Wine Week, which uh, is selling well. You can buy this through the website. And again, our expert English winemaker, Kieran Atkinson from the English uh, Wine um, Makers. So, you guys, what's happening out there? Great question, Charlie. Um, English Wine Project, not English Wine Makers. Um, yeah. it's, uh, it's been a funny old year so far. Very, very cold May. Uh, after what was the best ever May in the history of Mays last year. Uh, the, but the good news, the good news for, I think, the majority of vineyards is zero frost damage, or certainly very, very low frost damage. Mm-hmm. So uh, a vineyard full of inflorescence, a, a vineyard full of potential fruit, uh, and a, therefore a vineyard full of potential quality. So we just need a great summer. I've been going down the vineyards in southern England a bit, uh, Kieran, and, and I absolutely agree. Walking out into things like the Pinot Meunier and the Pinot Ch- and the Chardonnay uh, vines, and you're just seeing so much potential just sitting there. And when the sun comes out, you can see the... Because th- these days nowadays uh, are not like June days were 20 years ago. We may say, oh, this is a typical traditional June. June, it's lots of rain and a certain amount of sun. But those days are much warmer than they were. And I saw, I went to one vineyard, I saw it on a Monday and I saw it on a Friday about two weeks ago in Sussex. And the the growth was absolutely astonishing. And they'd only, they had three days of, of, of cloud and two days of, of sun. If we have um, a, a decent July and August, I, I would say that there's going to be lots of fruit um, uh, and it's uh, going to be very exciting for, for, for the great, for the, for the um, the grape growers but as uh, as i have a feeling more of a traditional english um ripening period uh, about me at the moment it's interesting you've got we've got wimbledon coming up and traditionally uh that wimbledon fortnight is when all the vines flower well it might be the same this year and we've been flowering earlier than wimbledon for the last few years fingers crossed to the second half of wimbledon fortnight where where certainly 10 years ago that was flowering yeah. So if we get a get a nice warm one this year, then I think there's a lot of potential. It will mean a late harvest. It will undoubtedly mean a late harvest. So I'd be surprised if anyone's picking in September this year. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of people still out there first week in November picking up the Chardonnays, Pinot Noirs. Well, not necessarily Pinots, but certainly Save Our Blancs up north. So it's uh, it's going to be it's going to be interesting. But well, uh, hopefully oh. things like things like the Bacchuses um because i worry about something like bacchus that too many of the conditions in the south of england are beginning to get a bit warm for it uh, and you're losing some of its aromatics so maybe um a slightly later more traditional english vintage with uh, all the knowledge that that growers have about something like bacchus now will bring back those beautiful hedgerowy aromatics which can easily get rather baked out if the summer gets too hot and long i actually saw an interesting an interesting um conversation about sauvignon blanc and about how some regions and i'm thinking essex uh south suffolk uh parts of kent uh can now ripen sauvignon blanc and i wonder what future sauvignons sauvignon blanc's got in the uk uh and and if, if the weather does kind of get gradually warmer whether or not it's got a big one and that also led me to think well did we ever give the older germanic varieties huxel reeb sieger reeb uh reichensteiner a, a chance i wonder whether or not we kind of bypassed their 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 moment uh and replaced them with things like sauvignon Yes, well, um, I've been doing the um, Wine GB Awards, and we did see quite a few interesting wines from Huxel Reber and Ziga Reber and those kind of things. And I wondered whether these were wineries, because we had a, a wider range of wineries entering Wine GB this year than ever before. And I wondered whether they were from what one might call the sort of more marginal counties to the west and to the north, uh, which are actually fine, and indeed Wales itself as well. Um, which are finding that that with a modern attitude and the modern knowledge that people like you um, sort of spread around the country, um, but 
you can now produce really very attractive, if you want to call it like that, slightly Sauvignon Blancish wines from Hoekstel Raber and those kind of grapes, because they do have a brief period, like Bacchus does, where it, with, with that lovely hedgerowy, bright, elderflowery style to them, or Hoekstel Raber, maybe slightly more fresh grapefruit, those, those sort of flavours, they do come up. They just get baked away very quickly. And how did you find the 2020 tasting in comparison to previous years? Um, the, the 2021 tasting, um, Sorry, very interesting because we had more wines than we've ever had before. Um, a lot of high quality coming through, understandably, in, in the classic cuvee um, sparkling wines. But interestingly enough, um, we had one or two of the non-vintages now, or the multiple vintages, whatever you want to call them, which were genuinely of, the, of, of a vintage quality. And that made me think uh, that two things. Firstly, either people are releasing them quite late uh, and therefore they're based on vintages like 2013, 2014, that kind of thing. Um, but um, more likely that people have built up enough reserve wine now over the last few years and that they're able to start putting reserve wine in with their younger wines in the traditional uh, champagne um, style. But what was really nice was that um, in four or five days tasting, I virtually never heard the word champagne. I virtually never heard the word burgundy. So we looked at Chardonnays, um, some very nice Chardonnays from 2019 and 2020. Um, but people weren't talking about, oh, this, this is, is a sort of minor burgundy. We were starting to talk about this is a lovely South of England style or this is a lovely Essex style. Uh, Pinot Noirs again. I think Pinot Noirs still a work in progress. Um, we, I thought the Pinot Noirs this year were considerably better than last year, but still not as good as people think they are. And they've been. I think that uh, quite a lot of critics have been a little too kind to um, the Pinot Noirs, and in fact they should have been slightly kinder to the Chardonnays probably, because I think there's genuinely some thrilling Chardonnay being made in this country. Um, I think most of the Pinot Noirs are still. A stretch in a way don't try too hard fellas this is this is england make an english style don't try please don't try and make a burgundy style if you can't make it um and i think that was coming through i thought one of the things last year that was a weakness in english wine uh was and and welsh but let's let's say english for the sake of it um was roses pink wines we should be making fantastic pink wines in this country and it, it's important that we do because for cash flow and for what the general public want they love pink wines at the moment it's summertime if the sun ever comes out again people will be rushing out to buy pink wines and i don't think that the the english pink wines last year uh, around the market were good enough this year there's an enormous improvement in pink wines um, now a lot of them have been made very pale um, I like a tiny bit more colour in, in, a, in a pink wine, to be honest. Uh, one or two darker ones, which were absolutely delicious. Um, but the paleness came with acidity and the paleness came with very bright, slightly primary pear and apple flavours, but just slightly tinged with things like rose hips, slightly tinged with things like a touch of strawberry, a touch of red, red cherry. And, and I thought this year, at last, it looked as though we we're beginning to get hold of the idea that, that, that England could be one of the great rosé producers of the world. And um, Bacchus-wise, is Bacchus still the kind of king of uh, white still wine, or would you say Chardonnay is now taking over that kind of mantle? I think Bacchus is, is in danger of showing that it's, it's not the greatest grape variety in the world. Um, and I think that it, uh, England is going to uh, discover that there are pa patches of England which it does really well in, um, and, but in the warmer parts of England, I think you're going to have to be really aware uh, in the vineyard that, that Bacchus must be shepherded so that it keeps its freshness. Um, it's, I think it's very easy for Bacchus to lose its freshness. And it's a bit like Sauvignon Blanc. As soon as you give Sauvignon Blanc too much sun and too much heat, it just becomes a totally dull, bland grape. And I think it's the same, same with Bacchus. And I remember talking to people in, about the 2018 vintage and wine uh, grape growers saying, I can't believe I'm saying this, but our, some of our grapes got too ripe. <laughs> but, but was it last year that... Um, Essex produced a Pinot Noir at 
Uh, that is absolutely mad in terms of what we've managed, but it does also show that we're we're no, we're now increasingly finding local climates, and I think the Blackwater and Crouch Estuary um, climate in 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 Essex there is proving itself as it's already proved in Chardonnay to be a, a really special place. Uh, and I bet, Kieran, that you're finding other patches right across the country, which, which you're thinking, hey, this has got somewhere really special, whether it's Derbyshire, whether it's Leicester, whether it's Gloucestershire or Shropshire, right the way down to Cornwall. Absolutely. I, I've become uh, really interested in that kind of fruit growing patch of the southwest of England, going from almost the three counties, going up from Gloucestershire, Herefordshire. I think it's got a huge amount of potential. Uh, Shropshire, that, that sort of Welsh border region. Where, where, you know, it, it has always traditionally been a great place to grow fruit. And at the moment, there isn't huge amount, there isn't huge amount of money investment being put into those parts of the world. So yeah. I wonder whether or not that would be a, that would be a, a great place to, to look. Um, I guess the, the, down, the clear downsides are way more rain than the southeast. Um, but on the positives, it's that kind of historical, that historical know-how, the historical fruit growing nature um and it's just a beautiful part of the world as well so it's yeah, it, oh heavenly part of the world but interesting enough talking of those uh shropshire uh, i've had a tremendous red wine uh this year from shropshire and had had it last year as well mm. um at gloucestershire gloucestershire is one of the places which has shown it can grow sauvignon blanc yes um as and uh, when you look at those areas on the edge of the Cotswolds, just getting down a little bit warmer, those enclaves where the Romans were, for instance. Um, and for all we know, there may have been Roman vineyards there 2000 years ago around Chedworth and those sort of places. Uh, I think there's I think there's fantastic potential in, in the lesser known areas, because after all, uh, with the exception of Newhall in Essex, everyone used to think Essex, you can't grow grapes in Essex. Well, Essex is now proving itself to be one of the best places in the whole country to grow grapes. And there's no reason why places like Gloucestershire, uh, um, uh, Shropshire, um, parts of Somerset, but not all. But I also think that the Herefords are fascinating idea because when you look at what Wales can do, when you Wales, if you look at the map of Wales, you think, oh God, all mountains and it's all raining. Well, up to a point, but look where the river valleys are. Uh, look where the Conwy River Valley is. The most in, uh, look where Montgomery's River um, Valley. It's protected. Look at the Vale of Denby. I mean, it's, it's, I look at the Vale of Denby and think that, and I know there are now vines there. There are thousands of vines there. But you just think that's the kind of special area in a cooler, damper place. And I bet Hereford's got a, a dozen of those. And variety-wise, um, did you see any kind of really interesting save our Blancs this year? I mean, sparkling-wise. I mean, because we've become so, and quite rightly so, so excited about Chardonnay's, Pinot Noir's, Pinot Mounier's because of our nearest great wine-growing region is Champagne. But are there now some savals which are, you know, possibly great, as good, uh, but obviously different? I mean, are you seeing that or not, or not so much? The, the nice thing was that they're different. I think that we're seeing the quality of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier as sparkling base is now so good. Um, and its acidity is beautifully focused. And the autolysis in the wines I saw, a lot of the autolysis this year uh, had been given a little more, um, little more play. And I think that also makes for a much more interesting wine. So when you came along to something like Seval, it normally tasted rather blank in comparison. Uh, we saw one or two lovely Sevals, but they were... You, I, I had to remind myself, and I'm sure the other ju judges had to remind themselves, we're judging Seval here. It is not Pinot and Chardonnay, because the Seval uh, with, I, I, I would say, although there are one or two wonderful Seval sparklers in the south of England, Breaky Bottom being a classic example, um, it, 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 if, you, if, you're, if you're in danger of saying, is a Blanc de Blanc from Chardonnay like a, a, um, a Champagne. And increasingly, we don't have to say that in England anymore. <laughs> if you even attempt to say Seval is like a Champagne, you're going up completely the wrong path. It isn't. There's something fundamentally feral and something slightly, some sort of slightly metallic mineral, something, there's, there's a blank in the heart of Seval, which, uh, which you never quite get past. I'm, I quite like Seval. But I know that um, uh, it's a it's a Marmite grape. It always performs very well if I'm doing wine tasting with probably people that drink more Prosecco than Champagne. 
uh, because you can get really nice fruit, but as you say, there isn't necessarily much backbone or a huge amount of structure in comparison to Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Um, but if you if you if you pair them up uh, in in a I guess a, a layman's tasting, it's it's it always leads to very interesting results. Um, by the way, Kieran, do you leave a sort of ten grams of sugar in on those sales? Yeah, I, I I for instance, when we did the tasting last year, I I didn't enjoy, I don't really enjoy I so Breaky Bottom is the best sable in the country, I think, by a long chalk. Uh, but really because they're kind of nine years on lease. Yeah, and, and the vines are 30 years old. Yeah. Um, but some and, of the, and yields are tiny. So yeah, all the right things. Yeah. I don't want to pick on Wales, but some of the Welsh ones are um they 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 I wouldn't even say they're green. They don't have as as, as almost don't like you say they don't really kind of have a character. Mm. Um they're, they're they're a blank canvas that they do go well though. Like if you it's almost um, varieties like, uh, where have I seen it? Um, Reichensteiner, Sabal, and Solaris. When those, and people that can't necessarily grow Chardonnay, Pinot Noir. Uh, Orion, Orion, do you like Orion? Uh, as a sparkler, is as a fruity sparkling wine. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's like when we had, when we tried, when we had the, um, uh, Cuvée Cherry. I didn't enjoy that wine. Um, too high in sugar. But if that was, I think actually that level of sugar with uh, with those varieties would be far better suited. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Absolutely agree. It's, you know, it's, it's an interesting. And Reichenstein. I, I remember talking to Tony Jordan of all people um, uh, about Reichenstein. And he was saying, "Oh, Reichenstein makes a very good sparkling base." Doesn't take a lot of autolysis, but make, takes a makes a very. We had at least one white Reichensteiner in the in the judging a couple of weeks ago, and I was delighted. It was smooth and soft and mellow and pretty dry, mm. and I thought, what a really charming glass of sparkling wine. Mm. I, um, I one of the best wines I in this country I've had was Ortega, uh, Bidenden's Ortega. I love that wine. It's so it got so much character. It's huge, yeah. and it's their bestseller. Year by year, people say, why, why aren't you selling, planting more Chardonnay, more Pinot? They said, because we're not picking, pulling out the Ortega. It's the first one that sells out at full price at the winery every year. Yeah, I think they picked that in September as well. So it must be a, yeah. a joy to pick in comparison to... Yeah, and would that mean they've still got enough methoxypyrazines in it to give it some... Give yeah. it some yeah, yeah. yeah. Um... Give me a, Lindenden's wines always used to have a bit of bite. They used to be lovely hooks all over. Mm. same old thing lovely bite to it i just think you know i'd hope we're getting well, you would know because you're on the on the ground a lot but i hope we're getting past this uh, obsession with things have got to be really ripe well i think it's um it's like going back to sauvignon blanc sauvignon blanc is a really interesting one because that's become pinot for red clearly is the like you know the, the chosen one um whether or not we can actually do it and there's some nice ones but like like you said i, I think there are some there's some pinots that are overhyped but selling at big money big money uh over, which, frank, over frankified too much new oak too much extraction you think the grapes didn't grapes didn't have it no i mean in a funny way you respect what someone like sam linter does at bolney because she doesn't try to do that um i think she could probably put a bit more into her pinot but and, and indeed she had in 19 and 20 but um yeah. but uh, but at least she's saying well this is an english style i haven't it's tried the lime bay 14.7 have you tried it uh, I haven't. I've spoken. I've spoken a lot to James down there, James Lambert. Uh, he bought those grapes, did he? Uh, they're they're Essex. Yeah, they're the Essex. Yeah. I bet he was first on the phone to say, "I want those." Uh, yeah, I think. Oh, I think. Well, I think the difference was he'd had long long standing relationships with the Essex growers. Yeah, and that's I think one of the main reasons that that uh, he, Liam moved up to Essex because he was yeah. making well, most the majority of his fruit came from Essex. Exactly, uh, all good stuff. Anyway, uh, yeah. was it from Danbury or was it from on uh, the stuff out on the crouch, uh, crou on the Blackwater or the Crouch? Off the Crouch. It was. It wasn't Danbury's. Don't believe so. No. So no. it's Clayhill or one of those. Yeah, I got the impression of Duncan McNeil that that was where it came from. Uh, I think. He... Well, I think. I mean, I was out there to have a good look around, and I, it just feels you can feel there's something special about it. Yes. And it makes absolute sense that the, that the storms hurry up the estuary, the black water, they hurry up the crouch, and you're just left. You know, as, as, in, as, in, as in so many special areas, the storms divide 
and you're left with 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 the sun and the breeze. It's going to be interesting to see what comes out of there. Um, yeah. And where, whether or not we're on fast forward a bit too much with the Sauvignons, I'm not sure. Um, well, have you tried to people like, um, is it Woodchester? I've tried Woodchesters. Uh, I liked it. Um, I've, I've also tried a lot more green pepper, slightly oniony Sauvignons than, than cut grass. Uh, green green pepper and cut, cut grass I like. The the onion thing I'm not so keen on. Um, it's right on the edge, unless you get it right. Um, actually, I, I do some consulting for uh, Blackdown Ridge Vineyard in Sussex, and they've got a beautiful site, and they, they grow Sauvignon, and it never quite makes it, but I hope not. And last year, we leaf-stripped, we leaf-stripped, and we shoot-thinned, and we green-harvested. And uh, I still didn't get there. Um, still didn't get there, even though you did all the things that I don't every, like. We did, we, did, we did everything possible other than kind of reflective um, reflective mulch or something. What, what, what Sauvignon Blanc are you, what, what, what clone? I don't actually know, I didn't plant it. Don't know. Is it CD1 or is it, or are they on French clones? Uh, French clones. Oh, so they won't get that lovely aromatic thing no, anyway. No, but CD1 no. wouldn't ripen here, would it? I don't think so. I mean, the again, it's that, it's it's the it's the green it's controlling the green pepper it's it's too much but the audience likes some green pepper they just don't want to four or five grams of sugar and green pepper is a pretty nice drink. I wondered if you if you were starting to see older wines and the wine tastings or, wh or whether they were mostly twenty twenty because for me English wine. No, no, we went back to twenty went back to twenty eleven I think. For still wine. No, not for still wines. The the still wines, I think, were back, back to 2018, possibly 2017. Oh, really? But, but uh, 2018, 2019 was probably the the most the dominant uh, vintage. But a lot of 2020 in all the in, in all the oddball whites, 2020, um, and the Chardonnays was a mix of 18, 19, and 20. Uh, the Pinots mix of 18, 19, and 20. Um, but I suspect a lot of people have sold out their 18, so um, they're showing 19s. I entered an oddball white this year. Uh, don't wonder how that get on, but I'll find out next week. You entered some oddball white. I had I had one oddball white, which was unfiltered, 100% uh, renovated oak, not new oak, um, from Sega Moreau, uh, just to just to make it more voluptuous, more uh, round uh, as round as possible, um, and that was the idea of the flavour. It was just it was to it was. It's, it's high in minerality as opposed to necessarily fruit. No, no sweetening at all. And which, which grape? Madeleine Langevin. Uh -huh. And you had one of the other wines, um, Kieran, I remember. It, I think, it, so you, you must come up to the winery. You both must, because there's doing yeah. some quite interesting stuff up there. Um, oh, I, 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 I know. Last week's wine tasting at the Wine GB 2021 Wine Awards. What are your general views on the 2020 wines and English wine uh, for this year? I'm feeling really optimistic about 2020 because um, we saw a fair number of 2020s and there's a lovely zip, a brightness, an energy, a freshness to the fruit. That's in reds and whites. Uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, where we are uh, as a country in wine now, well, we need to sell more. Um, because there's a lot of wine in the wineries at the moment needs to find customers. I would really say to everybody, try a local wine wherever you are. Every county in this country now has got, has got vineyards. Find out where they are. Go and try a local wine. Honestly, if every local person just did it once, we wouldn't have a sales problem in this country at all. Well, that's absolutely fantastic information from both of you. And I think you know, we are stuck in Britain. We are not going to be going abroad on our holidays. What a fantastic opportunity to, to support a homegrown industry. So, as Oz says, get out, get in your car, go and buy some wine from an English vineyard. And please remember to remain forever thirsty. <laughs>